light of current events, according to biblical prophecy. Um, I was here last Wednesday for the Bible study, and of course we're here uh, this morning, and Lord willing, I will be back with you again <clears throat> on Wednesday as a pastor, Chris Casey, is away. Please pray for him and his family, for God's travel mercies upon them, keeping them safe out there on the road until the Lord brings them back here. And I, I appreciate Brother Chris. He's a dear friend, and uh, he's just been a blessing to my wife and I. And uh, we just want to hear from heaven this morning. Amen. You want to know what God has in store for you and I. And uh, if you weren't here for uh, Sunday school, I talked about the Jewish prophet Zechariah and the surviving Jewish remnant. So some of you that were coming in caught the last half of that. But you can watch it. If you, have my, if you have me as a Facebook friend, you can watch it in its entirety. And we're also going to upload it to my YouTube channel, uh, Dr. August Rosado. As our brother said, I have a book table set up back there. If you do not receive our free Bible prophecy newsletters, they go out every single week. We've got one going out tomorrow. Uh, please sign up. We have a sign-up uh, book there. Give me your name, your email address, and please print clearly, okay? So that way we can get you into the database and you'll start receiving our free newsletters. If I misspell one letter, it's not going to go through, amen? And so just give me your name, email address, and please print uh, clearly. I also have books available that I have written on Bible prophecy. I have eight books that I have written on Bible prophecy. The two latest ones are, When Will This Generation End? And I explain what is a generation in the Bible. You know, some would say it's... Uh, <clears throat> what, maybe 80 years, 70 years, 40 years, or is it even a time period at all? Well, I explain that in my book, and I discuss, could this possibly be the generation? And then I wrote another book called Daniel, a Chronology, in which I show you how to read the book of Daniel in chronological order. A lot of people read Daniel numerically, straight through, chapters 1 <clears throat> uh, through 12. And a lot of people get confused because they say, well, August, you know, I was reading Daniel chapter number 5, and it talks about the death of King Belshazzar of Babylon. But when I get to chapter number 7, it talks about the reign of Belshazzar. What's up with that, August? There are no contradictions in God's word, amen? No contradictions at all. The problem is you're not reading it in chronological order. When you read it in chronological order, you will see how everything falls into place. The book also serves as a commentary on the book of Daniel, and so we have that book available there on the table, as well as When Will This uh, Generation End? And other books I've written on Bible prophecy, they are $20 each, or you can get all uh, eight of those books, I believe, for <clears throat> one one fifty. Save yourself shipping and handling, amen? Save yourself a few bucks on that. I'll autograph the books uh, for you, and we have them available uh, there on the table. You know, I am so thrilled and so joyful to be in the house of God, amen? When we come into the house of God, we should be thankful people. I don't think you heard me. <laughs> we should be thankful people, amen? We should be smiling people. We should be rejoicing people. You know why? Jesus is coming again. And guess who he's coming back for? You. He, listen, he's coming back for his own. He's coming back for his bride. And his bride is not the four walls of this building. His bride is not the roof. His bride is not the floor. His bride is not the pew or the pulpit. You are the bride of Jesus Christ. And he is coming back for his own. We don't know the day and we don't know the hour, amen? But I do believe that we are living in the times and the seasons of the coming of the Lord. I'm not telling any of you anything new. You see what's going on out there, do you not? I'm sure you watch the news if you can stomach it. I'm sure you probably read the paper and see what's going on in Israel, the Middle East, around the world, in our own backyard. I'm here to tell all of you this morning, we are living in what Paul the Apostle describes as the perilous time stage. We are living in those perilous times. And in you, if you read... 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. You would be like, oy vey, this is like reading the front page of a local newspaper, man. I mean, this Bible is an up-to-date book, is it not? And when you read verses 1 through 5 of 2 Timothy chapter number 3, you will notice, now I counted and I recounted, 19, 1, 9, 19 characteristics of the last days that we are witnessing right before our very eyes right now. Paul said these things will happen prior to Jesus' soon return. He said this know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Then he gives us those 19 characteristics. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despises of those that are good. They hate our guts. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. But verse 5 is the clincher. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, what are you to do? Say it again. Turn away. Do not let a cancer walk through the doors of Adam Square Baptist Church. It only takes one wrong individual with a wrong attitude, with wrong doctrine, to gum up the works. I've preached at churches all across these United States of America. And the things that my wife and I have seen on the road in God's house horrifies me. Church splits, lack of reverence for the house of God, infighting. It's like it's, it's getting worse. It's like the church in America has written its own obituary. We need to get back to biblical basics. Amen? Don't get your doctrine from the world. Don't get your doctrine from politics. And I'll take it a step further. Don't get your doctrine from Christian TV. You know where I'm going. You know where I'm going. Don't get your doctrine from Christian TV. Get your doctrine from the B-I-B-L-E. Get your doctrine from this 1611 KJV. Read your Bibles on a daily basis. From Genesis 1-1, to Revelation 22 21. It's imperative that we read our Bibles. When I preach at churches around the country, I like to sort of get a rise out of the people. You've probably heard me do this before, so you're going to get used to it. I say, you know something? I'm going to use a filthy word here today, a disgusting word. I know there are little kids here, and it's going to shock a whole lot of you. Probably won't see me back here again. But I'm going to use this dirty, filthy word. Are you ready? And I can see the pastor in the front, and his foot is like stomping really fast, man. You know, what is this guy about to say? I'm like, and here's that word, are you ready? And I can actually see mothers putting their fingers in their kids' ears. I'm serious, I'm serious. Here it is. Study. Well, that's really not a dirty word. In the church it is. We don't, we don't study our Bibles anymore. We're not reading our Bibles anymore. We're not memorizing Scripture anymore. Why? Because we're trusting those out there rather than the man of God behind the pulpit and this book right here. Did not Paul use that dirty word? <laughs> 2 Timothy 2.15, what did he say? Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing 
the word of truth. How are you going to divide the word of truth if you're not studying God's word? So it's imperative that we study God's word so that you and I can differentiate what is healthy doctrine and what is bad doctrine. You know, like there is good cholesterol, <laughs> right? And then there is bad cholesterol. What you want to do for health's sake is to avoid the bad cholesterol and take in the good cholesterol. How do you get good doctrine? Remember what Solomon said, Proverbs 4, 2, I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. In order to get good doctrine, you must study God's word, especially in the area of Bible prophecy. Or what they would say in theological terms, eschatology. What is eschatology? It is the doctrine of last things. What is going to happen in the not too distant future. Don't let Bible prophecy intimidate you. You think God put it in the Bible to intimidate us? Bible prophecy is not there to scare us. Listen to me. It's there to prepare us. Amen? It's not there to scare. It's there to prepare. I've had some people in churches who come up to me and say, Brother Rosado, <laughs> Bible prophecy scares me. I can't read the book of Daniel. I can't read the book of Revelation. It terrifies me. Well, there's only one solution for this. Just get saved. Get born again. Call upon the name of the Lord and get saved. That is how you prepare. Amen? Amen. By faith, trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And never be intimidated, never be afraid to study the books of Daniel, Revelation, the book of Zechariah, because those are all apocalyptic books that deal with apocalyptic literature. What is going to happen in the not too distant future? We're living in exciting days, I mean, very exciting days, but folks, we're living in very dangerous days. Very dangerous times. You're not safe where you go anymore. Even the church house could be a soft target from some lunatic out there. It's the last days. It's the perilous times. That trumpet is about to sound. We're about to hear from heaven a shout. <clears throat> What's he going to shout? I don't know, but it says he'll shout. And then there'll be a voice of the archangel and the blowing of a shofar, a trumpet. And the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore we are told what? To comfort comfort one another with these words. I can stand here this morning behind this sacred desk at Adam Square Baptist Church and tell all of you born-again, blood-washed saints there's something comforting to look forward to. Jesus did not leave us behind as orphans. He said, I will come again. Our brother just mentioned that, John 14, 1 through 3. He said, let not your heart be troubled. This is Jesus talking. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If one else, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He's been doing that for the past 2,000 years. I go to prepare a place for you. He's getting heaven ready. And if I go and prepare a place for you, you've got to love these four words, I will come Again, Muhammad never said that to the Muslims. Neither did Buddha or Confucius to their followers. David Koresh or all these other cult people never gave that promise to their followers. But Jesus said, I will come again. And I will receive you, church, unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. That's comforting. That puts a smile on my face. 
And as I walk through this miserable life of sin and wickedness, I can take comfort, and so can you, knowing that my salvation is sealed. I can't lose my salvation. And Jesus said, I will come again. Woo! It doesn't get any better than that, amen? You should all be shouting right now, hallelujah, Brother Rosado. He is coming again. And that's why I've been focusing on the events of the Middle East, around the world, how close we may be to Jesus' soon return. So I want to encourage you, after today, please come back out on Wednesday as I finish this finale on the events that are going on in the Middle East. Listen, please, I don't want to be politically correct or politically incorrect. I just want to be biblically correct. I want to teach you Bible prophecy responsibly. Because you've got those guys out there today that are irresponsible when it comes to teaching Bible prophecy by date setting, claiming this guy's the Antichrist, that guy's the Antichrist, this guy's a false prophet, that guy's a false prophet. We don't need that type of nonsense. Let's just stick with the book. Amen? We cover the political because the political is set in the stage for the prophetic to be fulfilled. When the dust settles and the smoke clears, only one nation will be left standing. Whether you like it or not, whether the world likes it or not, only one nation will be left standing. Well, how do you know that, Brother Rosado? Glad you asked. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah. Let's take our Bibles, go to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 30, if you will, please. The book of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah is right before the book of Lamentations, if that will help you out there. Jeremiah, chapter number 30. And we're going to look at verse number 11, please. <clears throat> Jeremiah, chapter 30, and verse number 11. And as you turn in there, Jeremiah, chapter 30, in context, talks about the promise of a return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. And folks, God has kept his promises. Does he not keep his promises? Is he not a covenant-keeping God? Man lies. Let me say that again. Man lies. And man lies right between his teeth. They lie in politics. They lie in religion. The, the Bible's clear. Let God be true, but every man a liar. God can do anything that he wants, but there's one thing he can't do. There's one thing he's incapable of. He cannot lie. Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2. In hopes of eternal life, in which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. God promised that he would take the Jewish people from the four corners of the earth that they were scattered to and bring them back into their own homeland. Now, I cannot set a date for the rapture because that's unbiblical. Because Jesus said we don't know the day and we don't know the hour. Matthew 24, verse 36. But I do have a date as to when Ezekiel 37 was fulfilled, the dry bones vision. May 14th, 1948. After nearly 2,000 years of wandering from nation to nation, being persecuted and killed along the way, the Jewish people are back in their own homeland. And I'm here to tell you, that's not a coinky dink no coincidence. That's a God incident. That's God keeping his word. Even though right now Israel is in a state of unbelief, that has to be the case. They must remain in a state of unbelief. In preparation for what? A 
seven, exactly, a seven year period of tribulation. Bible prophecy should motivate you and I in these last days in which we live to be soul winners. Amen? To evangelize, to be soul winners, to support missions. I mean, I just learned from my wife a couple of days ago of a young missionary couple in Haiti. Have you heard of this? Have you read it? Young missionary couple in Haiti, husband and wife, who were murdered just a couple of days ago. It's all over the news, Fox News. Murdered a couple of days ago by gangs in Haiti. They're martyrs. They gave their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's in a country overrun by gangs and poverty. I mean, that should break your heart, amen? And they knew that, but they still went there because that's what God called them to do. America has become a mission field in itself. Now, you know next month is what month? June. And you know what they're going to be cramming down your throats, right? Oh, yeah. You see it coming, man. They're going to cram this stuff down our throats, whether we like it or not. Especially to your kids in the public school systems. You know why? It's not about education anymore. It's no longer education. It's indoctrination. It's part of that last day scenario. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 30. Look with me, please, in verse number 11. God speaking here. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whether I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, once again, thank you so much, Lord, for allowing us to come into your presence to worship you, magnify and glorify your holy and righteous name. Father, I pray that as I preach this message that you would keep me within the bounds of Scripture. I'm not here to offer an opinion. I'm here to give the Word of God, the Bible, the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And Lord, as I preach this message, I pray that your Holy Spirit give me the utterance, the unction from heaven on high to preach this message clearly and unambiguously, Lord. And Father, once again, if there is someone here and they do not have that assurance of going to heaven when they die, Lord, it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit of God would prick their hearts and they would, by faith, call upon the name of the Lord, be born again, through the Spirit of God, that they would be ready for either one or two things, either death or the next main event on God's calendar of activities we call the rapture of the church. That could even be today. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know he's coming soon. Father, thank you for what you're about to do now, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Now, God told the Jewish prophet, Jeremiah, he prophesied at around between 627 and 626 B.C. God told the Jewish prophet Jeremiah that in the future he will destroy all nations that come up against Israel. This is in an attempt to annihilate the Jewish people from the face of the earth. But as I said already, when the dust settles and the smoke clears, the Bible is unambiguous. The Bible is very clear here as to one nation that's going to be left standing. And folks, that's the nation of Israel. Think about this. Out of the 195 nations in the world, only one nation will be left standing. One nation where the kingdom will emanate from. One nation where Jesus Christ will reestablish David's throne and sit on that very throne. Based on Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, Luke 1, 32 and 33, folks, that is the nation of Israel, the only nation 
left standing. Why? Well, based on Ezekiel chapter 5 and verse number 5, here's the holy city of Jerusalem here. There's the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall, as they say in Hebrew, the Kotel. The Jewish prophet Ezekiel said, Thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. Yerushalayim in Hebrew. This is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. So what Ezekiel is saying, God set Israel in the middle of the world, in the midst of all the nations that surround her. And when Jesus returns at his second coming, he is coming back to the very center of the earth. Amen. He's not going to Rome. He's not going to Washington, D.C. He is coming back to Israel. He is coming back to the city of Jerusalem that God set in the very center of the earth. This is where the prophesied millennial kingdom reign of Yeshua the Messiah will emanate from. The kingdom prophesied by the Jewish prophets, but we don't have a length of time in the Old Testament until you get to the New Testament where Revelation chapter 20 verses 2 through 7 tells us that that kingdom will last for 1,000 years from that very city that you're looking at. I've been to that land and that city 34 times, ladies and gentlemen. It is absolutely a beautiful, holy city. It's the city where the literal Davidic theocratic kingdom will emanate from, from the holy city of Jerusalem, Earth's capital, during that 1,000-year elongated period of time. The Sar Shalom himself, the Prince of Peace, Jesus will reign from that very city. The rabbis tell us that Israel is in the center of the earth. And they tell us that Jerusalem is in the center of Israel. And they tell us that the Temple Mount is in the middle of Jerusalem. This is where the Millennial Temple will stand based on Ezekiel chapters 40 through 46. See where that golden dome is right there? That's the Islamic shrine. I don't know if someone can maybe kill the lights in the front so you can see it better. This is where the Islamic shrine of the Dome of the Rock is. That sits on the site where Solomon's temple stood for 400 years, where Herod's temple stood in the time of Jesus Christ for 600 years. That's the Temple Mount right there. Thank you, brother. Har Harbayat in Hebrew, the house, the hill of uh, the house. And this is where the Dome of the Rock sits today. According to Bible prophecy, a third temple is going to occupy that site. That would be the Tribulation Temple that will be desecrated by the Antichrist. And when Jesus reigns for that 1,000 years, he will establish a fourth temple, and that will be the Millennial Temple. Uh, Ezekiel chapters 40 through 46, covering 202 detailed verses of Messiah's temple. Even though God corrected Israel, and believe me, he has, God has corrected Israel in measure due to unbelief, due to rebellion, listen to me, he has not rescinded his promises that he made to the Jewish people. When God made a promise to you, did he rescind on that promise? Absolutely not, amen. When he made a promise to Israel, he never rescinded on those promises. God has destroyed nations in the past who sought Israel's demise. Uh, folks, I am talking major world empires that have tried to destroy the Jewish people. I'm talking about the Egyptian Empire. I'm talking about the Assyrian Empire. I'm talking about the Babylonian Empire. I'm talking about the Medo-Persian Empire. I'm talking about the Grecian Empire. I'm talking about the mighty Roman Empire. Where are they today? In ruins. Why? They thought they were bigger than God. And they threw dirty punches against the Jewish people. And even though God would use some of these nations to discipline Israel, they enjoyed trying to destroy the Jews. And God said, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's back up there, pal. I used you in measure to discipline my people, but now you're trying to destroy my people. And God destroyed these very nations. God has also eliminated modern-day despots, if you will. You know, for example, in biblical times, Haman, you've read the book of Esther. I know you have. And you saw what Haman, the Agagite, tried doing to the Jews of Persia. What did he try to do? He tried to hang every Jew from Esther and her uncle Mordecai on down. He wanted to hang every single Jew in Persia. And what's interesting about the book of Esther is that the name of God is not mentioned once in that book. Which is why it was not found among the other books of the Bible of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered near the Dead Sea in the case of Qumran in 1947. 
God's name is not mentioned once throughout that book, but it's obvious that the hand of God was moving on behalf of the Jewish people. And instead of hanging the Jews, Haman and his followers were hanged on the same gallows that he prepared for the Jewish people. Haman ca tried carrying out the atrocities against the Jewish people. Adolf Hitler carried out atrocities against the Jewish people and murdering six million Jews. Where's Adolf Hitler today? What about Saddam Insane? Where is he today? Another modern death. Where are they today? They're gone. But guess who's still here? The Jews. And there was a state in the Middle East called the State of Israel. Don't you dare tell me that's a coincidence. I believe this book. I believe every jaw and tittle of this book from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. And let's not forget, I mentioned them during Sunday school, but I want to make this brief because I want to let you go early. I'll hopefully, hopefully see you back on Wednesday. Can't forget this guy. Who I would now say is the late president of Iran. I'm talking about President Ibrahim Raisi. Well, what happened to Ibrahim Raisi? Well, just about a week ago, he died in a helicopter crash in Iran. I take no joy or pleasure in that, folks, because it's probably unfortunate that this guy died and went to hell. In 1988, that's the year I got saved. In 1988, you know what they call this guy? They call him the Butcher of Tehran. I'm not telling you nothing new. This guy in 1988 was responsible for murdering thousands and thousands of Iranian prisoner dissidents. This guy. Then, what was it, uh, last month, he shot 300 drones and missiles at Israel. 300. By the grace of God, and even some politicians today are saying, well, that's a miracle. Well, that, that's God, man. Israel, the United States, and Jordan shot down 99%. 99% of those 300 drones and missiles fired by this butcher. And you know something? The United Nothing, because that's what they are. The United Nations had a moment of silence for this murderer. That's like saying, we're going to have a moment of silence for Adolf Hitler. We're going to have a moment of silence for the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Give me a stinking break, amen? But on October 7th, 2023, when Hamas murdered 1,200 men, women, children, baby, all Israelis, where was the UN moment of silence? Where was that? It was nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found at all. You say, well, do you think that the hand of God was involved in that? I don't know. But you know something? There are too many coincidences out there. God took down empires in biblical times, modern despots during our time, Now I wouldn't be surprised if we did it with this guy. Because I believe in Genesis 12, 3, do you? I will bless those who bless thee. And I will curse those who cursed thee. I told you during Sunday school, you don't have to agree with every politic that goes on within the government of the state of Israel, but you know what the Bible says. And Israel's place in the not too distant future. To shoot down 99% of drones? I mean, that's, that's 99%, that's crazy. I believe the hand of God was on that there. It could have been worse. 300 drones carrying, uh, uh, you know, weapons on them, missiles, and yet 99% of them, ladies and gentlemen, were shot down, launched by the late butcher of Tehran. It's not a coincidence. How many coincidences do you need, folks? Really? It's a God incidence. God removed the evil men from the world in biblical times. And I believe he's doing it today. Why would he stop today? The Bible clearly describes 
that God is unchangeable, is he not? In theological terms, he would say God is immutable. God is immutable. And the Jewish prophet Malachi makes that clear. Malachi, oh, come on now. Let's jump it on me here. Let's go back. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. God is immutable. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Why is Israel still here today after all these nations trying to wipe them out? After Adolf Hitler murdered six million Jews. After Saddam Hussein fired Scud missiles. Iran calling for Israel to be eliminated. On Why are the Jews still here? Because of God's promises. That's why he says, the re that's why you sons of Jacob are not consumed. God said, I made promises to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant. I made promises to David in the Davidic covenant. I made promises to Jeremiah in the new covenant. Israel will be the last nation standing. Why? Because August Rosado said so? No. Thus saith the Lord. God is immutable. And I'll tell you something else. Next month coming up, when they're going to cram homosexuality down your throat. Because what do they call it? Pride month. I don't hate those people. I love them. Did you hear me? I love them. I love them enough to warn them that this lifestyle is unacceptable in the eyes of God. It's not natural. And you have no right to cram it down our kids' throats in the public school system. It's not education. It's indoctrination. They know exactly what they're doing. Do you think for a moment this book changes with culture? I got a Bible verse that'll blow that out of the water, and I know you know it, and it's right there. Can can somebody read that nice and loud? All of you read it nice and loud. Immutable. This book does not change over time because culture changes. If God said it's sin, well, guess what? It's sin. The reason why. Sodom fried was because of pride. God doesn't change. I would love them enough to share with them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and warn them of that lifestyle. They're the ones that have to make that decision to either receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. For I, the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. In terms of all this evil anti-Semitism, you all know Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, resulted in 1,200 Israeli men, women, children, babies, decapitated in the cribs, burned alive in the ovens. United Nations wasn't mourning over the Israelis, but they would mourn a butcher of Tehran. Something's not right there. And now you have the ICC, the International Criminal Court, looking to apply arrest warrants for war crimes. Against who? Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and top Israeli officials. And of course, to save face, he said, oh yeah, we're going to issue arrest warrants toward Hamas as well, but we know what the number one target is here, ladies and gentlemen. What is the crime of Israel? The crime of Israel is that we defend ourselves. And who are we defending ourselves against? Terrorists who seek our destruction. October 7th, 2023 is when Hamas carried out these atrocities. Hamas falls under the category of not only terrorism, on the State Department's list of terrorists, but they fall under the negative aspect of Genesis 12.3. I'll curse those who curse thee. Israel said, we did not start this war, but we're going to finish it. Doesn't matter what the world says, we are going to finish it. It reminds me, this is parallel to Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 11, where we started off. Look what it says right here. Jeremiah 46, 28. Fear thou not, O Jacob, or Israel, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end of all nations, whether I have driven thee 
but I will not make a full end of thee, Israel, but correct thee in measure, yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. God said, yeah, Israel, I was gonna, I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to correct you. I might even use another nation to do exactly that. And God has. But God said, there's one thing I'll never do. I'll never break my covenant with you. I'll never break my promises to you. For all those anti-Semites out there today, you better smarten up. I know it got quiet in here. But I'm going to say it again. To all you anti-Semites, you better smarten up. You know why? The Bible gives you the formula on how to destroy the Jews. Did you know that? Clearly, the Bible gives the formula, the ingredients on how to wipe the Jews off the face of the map. All you have to do is read Jeremiah 31 and Jeremiah 35. Right there, God says, this is how you destroy the Jews. This is what God said. If you can count every single star in the sky and give me an accurate number, I'll break my promises to Israel. Question, is that possible? God gives you another one. If you can count every single grain of sand on the seashore and give me an accurate number, God said, I'll break my promises to Israel. Is that possible? Absolutely not. God said, if you can measure the universe and to its length, and then give me an accurate measurement, I'll break my promises to Israel. Is that possible? So what is God telling you? It's impossible for me to break my promises to Israel. We're almost done here. We've got a few minutes left here. Listen, folks, despite all this Jewish hatred, all this anti-Semitism around the world, God is going to one day intervene. Fly away. God is going to one day intervene in the affairs of man. And the book of Revelation lays it out for you and I. And we know clearly from the reading of the book of Revelation, God is going to pour out 21 judgments on the earth. Not only will God pour out 21 judgments on the earth, the satanic trio will be in full power. The dragon, Revelation 12, 3, that's Satan. The beast, Revelation 13, 1, that's the Antichrist. And the false prophet, Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 11, will seek to annihilate the Jewish people from the face of the earth based on our reading of Revelation chapter number 12. And all this garbage that we see with these protests going on around the world today, it's sowing the seed for that. I told you already what that chant means. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. The river, the Jordan River. The sea, the Mediterranean River. Only a 70-mile space between the two. How can you defend 70 miles of that kind of space? You can't! But the world is saying, Israel, you need to go back to the pre-1967 borders. Are you kidding me? There is no way Israel would be able to defend themselves in a 70-mile radius. Come on. That will never ever happen. But yet, we have politicians, all these anti-Israel agitators, all these anti-Semites, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. If you read your Bibles, and you study Bible prophecy, you will know that when you refer to the land, you never refer to the land by that name. 2,500 and 66 times in your King James Bible, do you know what God calls the land? Israel. Israel. I will fight for you. Israel. God never called it Palestine. No such place. No such culture. No such history. That goes back to 135 AD when the Roman Emperor Hadrian crushed the Jewish revolt against Rome. He banned Jews from going to Jerusalem. He renames Jerusalem Alia Capitolina in honor of the Roman god Jupiter. And he renamed the land of Israel 2,000 years ago. He renamed the land of Israel Palestine to honor who? The Philistines. Who were the Philistines? They were Greeks. They came over from the Greek islands, settled off the coast of the Mediterranean in Gaza. They were the arch nemesis of Israel during that time. 
They're the ones that destroyed Shiloh in the center part of the state of Israel and destroyed the tabernacle. It was the Philistines that did that. Took the Ark of the Covenant, brought it back to Gaza. You all know the rest of the story. Don't have a whole lot of time to develop that. You cannot defend 70 miles from the river to the sea. And all these Congress people today, like the, what do they call themselves? The squad? They call themselves the squad. AOC. What's her name? Alex Ocasio Cortez, if I got that correct. Rashida Tlaib. Ilan Omar. They all make this chant. And yet, Americans still vote these people back into power. This is what God's going to pour out in the not too distant future, folks. Seven seals opened by Jesus Christ himself, Revelation 6 1, resulted in one fourth of the world's population dying, at least 1.4 billion people. When that's done, seven trumpets, Revelation chapters 8 and 9, another one third of humanity dies, another 1.4 billion. And then after that, seven vials or seven bowls, Revelation chapters 15 and 16. I don't have a number as to how many people will pass away at that time. But I can only imagine, ladies and gentlemen, the carnage that is going to follow. But at the end of that seven-year period of tribulation, there's light at the end of the tunnel. I know you've read the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter number two. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that terrified him. I'm closing it right here, okay? We're going to end right here. He has a dream. He's terrified. It was a nightmare to him. He's calling for the so-called wise men of Babylon. Hey, man, I had a nightmare. Can you guys please interpret my dream? Uh, I'll tell you what, Nebby. You tell us what you dreamed, and we'll give you the interpretation. Oh, no, 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 no. You ain't going to pull a fast one. You, told, you tell me what I dreamed, and you give me the interpretation. What you're asking for, king, is unreasonable. Listen, if you don't interpret the dream, I'll make your houses a dunghill. I'll murder you all. We can't do it, king. The Bible says he was so enraged, so enraged, he wanted to kill all the wise men of Babylon, including Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, those four Jewish boys who were brought over from Judea into Babylon. God reveals the dream to Daniel. Daniel looks at the eunuch and says, bring me in front of the king, quick. They take Daniel before the king. King, I'm going to tell you what you dreamed and give you the interpretation. Not because it's me, but there's a God in heaven who revealed its secrets. Only God can do this. King Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold, Babylon. But you're going to be destroyed by the breast and arms of silver, which is the Medo-Persian Empire. But the Medo-Persian Empire will be destroyed by the belly and thighs of brass, which will be the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great. But then the Grecian Empire will be destroyed by the legs of iron, which will be the Roman Empire. Gold, Silver, bronze, iron, gone. <gasps> Wait, I didn't get to the ten toes. The ten toes are future. The ten toes are a future revived Roman Empire. Later on, these ten toes are called ten horns in Daniel and in the book of Revelation. At the end of the tribulation period, those final ten toes or ten horns will seek to make war with Jesus Christ. Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. Daniel said, I saw a stone, keep your eye on the laser, I saw a stone come down from heaven, and then that stone came down and boom! Crushed, destroyed the ten toes of the revived Roman Empire. And then that stone became a great mountain filling the whole entire earth. A reference to the millennial kingdom reign of Jesus Christ from the holy city of Jerusalem. Daniel 2, 34-35 is parallel with Revelation 19, 11-16. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, upon his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This is where you come in church. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress, and the fiercest and the wrath of 
Almighty God had upon his vesture and upon his thigh was a name written King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Guess who's coming back with him? You. Riding on what? A white horse clothed in what? Fine linen representing righteousness and purity. We're coming back with him as he reigns as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he will crush the ten toes of the revived Roman Empire. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, it doesn't get any better than that. Stage is being set. Actors are getting into position. Curtain is about to go up on the end time drama. Up next on God's calendar of activities, the rapture of the church. Jesus is coming soon. The question is, are you ready? Are you rapture ready? What if the real shofar from heaven was to sound right now? Would Adam Square Baptist Church be completely empty at the rapture if it was to happen right now? Or would some of you still remain in the pews after the rapture? Jesus is only coming for born-again people. Not unregenerated, regenerated. He's coming for born-again Christians. And anybody left behind at the rapture, you will go through that terrible, unprecedented seven-year period of tribulation. You say, August, how do you know that ram's horn you're holding in your hand? I bought this in Israel last year, last March in Jerusalem. It has the line of the tribe of Judah on it. It's absolutely beautiful. Usually I blow my Yemenite so far, it's longer, but I want to blow this one today. I'm convinced that this ram's horn so far is a trumpet in the scriptures. You say, how do you know that? Well, read Joshua chapter 6, verses 4, 5, 6, 8, 13. Five times it says the priest, the Kohen Haggadol, the priest blew the trumpet of ram's horns. So a ram's horn in the Bible is the trumpet. And in terms of the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, Paul said, I would not have to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which I would sleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also them which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain, caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now you know me, I love to toot my own horn. Everywhere I go, I love to toot my own horn in a good way though, amen? The ram's horn the trumpet at the time of the rapture, the shofar. Could it be today? Who knows? Come up, Heather! Woohoo! And faster than you can... Do you like that? You like that? That little man likes that. And faster than you can blink the human eye, bye-bye. We're out of here, man. See you later, world. Nice knowing you, not. <laughs> He's coming back, but the question is, is he coming back for you? Every head bowed, every eye closed, we're going to be dismissed. With every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a few minutes, I'm not going to drag this out. But if you're sitting here this morning and you're saying, August, I do not have the assurance to go to heaven when I die. If my heart was to stop beating in my chest right now, I think I'd split hell wide open. If the real shofar from heaven was a sound August, I think I might be the only one sitting in the pew here at Adam Square Baptist Church, left behind. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to die and go to hell for the rest of eternity. August, I want to be ready. I want to be rapture ready. I want to get saved right now. August, would you pray for me this morning that I would get saved? If I'm speaking to you, all you simply need to do is slip that hand up and put it down. By doing so, all you ask me to do is pray for you. I don't need to know your name. I'm not looking to embarrass anybody. But by slipping up your hand, all you're telling me to do is pray for you. August, pray for I see that hand. God bless you, my friend. August, pray for me. I need to be saved. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. We just saw one hand go up. Would there be another hand? 
I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. Anybody else? Okay, let me ask you this. If you are saved, born again, washed by the blood, you know you're ready to go, whether by death or by rapture. If you're saved, would you raise your hand as a testimony? August, I'm saved and I know it. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm ready to go. Praise God. Okay. Some hands went up. Some hands did not. Thank you. You can put those hands down. God bless you. If you're not saved, you need to talk with someone here at Adam Square Baptist. I'll be more than happy to sit down and talk with you. There are other men that are willing to talk with you. Women, there are other women here who can sit down and talk with you. But listen, get saved today. Tomorrow might be too late. Well, August, how do I get saved? It's as simple as ABC. You can pray, and it's not the prayer that saves you, but you're praying to the one who can save you. You could pray something like this. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. We all deserve your judgment and wrath. We all deserve to go to hell. But thank you, God, for your mercy and your grace and for sending your son to die for me. I right now, by faith, trust in Jesus as my Savior. Lord, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I right now receive you as my Lord and personal Savior. Cleanse me from my sin. Make me a new creature. Help me to live my life for you and to serve you until death or the rapture. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me today. In your name I pray. With nobody looking, with nobody looking, if you prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up? I, August, I just prayed that prayer. I just trusted in Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Do we have anyone like that here? Did you just pray that prayer? Did you just pray that prayer? Okay, right now what I'm going to do is pray. Dismiss all of you. Please, I hope to see you all come back again on Wednesday as we continue this theme on Bible prophecy. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word. Oh, it's so exciting, dear Lord, when we can study Bible prophecy. As long as we study it responsibly and teach it responsibly, to read it accurately. And Lord, I pray for those that have lifted up their hands saying, I need to be saved. I pray that they act on that, Lord. I pray they not walk out of here lost and undone, one heartbeat away from hell, one trumpet sound away from being left behind at the rapture. How tragic that is. Thank you for this opportunity. Be again with Brother Chris uh, Casey and his family. Give them travel mercies. Watch over them and protect them. Thank you, Lord, for these dear people, these brethren that are here this morning. And I'm praying that we would be back on Wednesday as we once again open your word and look at it for its plain sense interpretation. And all we can say to that is, Maranatha, even so come, Lord Jesus. For it's in his precious name we pray, amen and amen. Love you guys. You're all dismissed. And hopefully, Lord willing, we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you. God bless.